Um, welcome to the uh, second annual iteration of the AIA uh, LA Creativity Conference, where we explore creative lives outside of the architectural community. I'm David Kennedy, the chair of the Interior Architecture Com Committee. Um, we want to uh, thank you, thank the participating sponsors for tonight, Armstrong Ceilings, Integrated Marketing Solutions, Building Product Reps, and MOSA. And then also the virtual exhibitors, PLP SoCal Lighting Reps, and SolarTube International. So um, be sure to uh, visit the sponsors exhibit breakout rooms during the break for um, their presentations. And then um, as Kareen mentioned, at the end of the evening, we'll have uh, announce a raffle winner for a Louis Paulson NJP table lamp that was donated by PLP SoCal. So um, tonight we're fortunate to have our evening moderated by the longtime design team of Ming Fung and Craig Hodgetts, partners at Hodgetts and Fung Design Lab. Craig is a creativity conference veteran, giving us insightful moderation last year. And this year, we are doubly blessed by having Ming join him. So to introduce our presenters and guide us into the creative discussion, I'll hand it over to Ming and Craig. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Craig Hotchitz, and this is Ming Fong, and we will be acting as moderators for today's discussion on creativity. We're especially excited about today's guest couple because like us, they built their professional and personal lives together out of a mutual passion for design. And in our case, education. Noel O'Connell and Yasna Sokolovic our husband and wife team behind Dear Human, their craft-based collection of quirky, sometimes amusing and original paper objects, which grew out of their uh, mutual interest in ceramics. Jasna Sokolovic studied architecture at the University of Sarajevo and at the University of Belgrade in former Yugoslavia before immigrating to Canada during the war and completed her studies in fine arts at Emily Carr University in Vancouver, British Columbia. Noel O'Connell is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin and uh, Madison and holds an MFA from Rhode Island School of Design. He is a Fulbright scholar in art and architecture and spent six years studying and working in art restoration and ceramics in Thailand and China. Our other guest is somebody we hope to find ways of working with in the future as our mutual interests in the civic realm coincide. Carmen Zella is the founder and principal of Now Art, an agency whose mission is to curate public art projects, nurture and connect artists, and help them to make sense of the maze of regulations, approvals, and aesthetic roadblocks. But most of all, she inspires both developers and municipalities to reach higher. With influences in her own life, she says that Zaha Hadid, Gordon Mata Clark, and Donald Jug have influenced her sensibility, along with John Cage and Fluxus philosophy. The Fluxus philosophy that art is life and life is art. Carmen holds an MFA in interdisciplinary art from Concordia University and spent 10 years juggling events such as Coachella for the Do Art Foundation while working as a freelance video editor before coming to rest at Now Art. Um, but, first. And then, but first now what we would like to do is to, uh, to make a few comments on our topic. So let me share our screen with you. So most people's days are decidedly mundane. Uh, creativity is everywhere, but granular. It is the way we fill a lunchbox, arrange a bouquet, or plan a trip. There's a steady 
hum of chores and the burst of enthusiasm when our team wins, but perhaps a chance to get together with a visiting friend, but very darn little unless something goes wrong. That absolutely demands our creative energy. But it is there, ready and waiting for a chance to shine. And as designers, we get that chance more often than most. In fact, it is hard to find anything but creative challenge in our line of work. So Craig and I, we have tried to sort out some of the underlying dynamics. And the beginning of a creative journey often started with a question, what if? So what if Isaac Newton hadn't wondered why an apple fell to the ground? Or Madame Curie wondered why a certain substance gave off an eerie glow in the dark. The painter Robert Owens gave up painting when he couldn't somehow eliminate the thickness of the paint and turn to pure light instead. Or what if a performer were to invent their own instrument? What if they were to turn themselves to an instrument. Laurie Anderson did that, just that, building a violin bow with a tape recorder instead of a horsehair that allowed her to store musical phrases on the bow and play them back. In effect, sampling without all of the D DJ stuff and in fact, preceding them by a decade or so. But she didn't stop there. Neon lighting her violin, creating goggles with searchlight, and wiring her body to translate movement into sound. She complemented that pure inventive energy with lyrics she performed on stage. While that kind of resourcefulness is relatively common in the performing arts, it is less common in manufactured products where designers often lack the resource to develop an idea. So speaking about resources, I'm happy to talk about Charles and Ray Eames. They built this contraption. They called it the Kazam machine. It's a Rube Goldberg uh, concoction, of two by fours, a bicycle pump, electric heating wire, and a plaster mold, which they had to hide in their bedroom because their landlord would, they were hoping the landlord wouldn't discover it in order to experiment with foam plywood. Their idea to bend plywood into the shape of a chair was at that time more or less impossible. But to make it happen required, first of all, belief and resourcefulness, a belief that would sustain the effort that would go beyond the boundaries of the job. That makes your effort worthwhile and rewarding. One that would have the power of conviction persuade no-goers to take a ride with them, with their idea, which is what must have given them the energy to persevere in spite of the challenges. And of course, sometimes it is not about challenges. It is about fiddling around, having fun, with only imagination, scraps of fabric, wired, and a pair of pliers. Alexander Calder created a fantasy circus full of imagine, imaginary character. Elephants, high wire artists, clowns, whimsical far outside the confines of the Parisian art world where his contemporary were busy dueling with the avant-garde. He was just having a ball playing just for the fun of it. What he was doing, we think, was to indulge in the pure pleasure of his imagination, doing what he truly loved, whether you are mathematically gifted or strategically gifted, like the heroine of Queen's Gambit, or visually endowed, following what truly inspired you, rather than looking back over your shoulder, helps to keep your eyes on that light at the end of the tunnel. Now, sometimes, of course, 
that can lead to something so unique that it disrupts the no normal course of things. Rick Owens' approach to fashion did just that. It started with an attitude. His first boutique was an empty space in Hollywood with no store fixtures, no dressing rooms, barely any light, and the garments were displayed or not as a pile of clothes which customers were invited to rummage through until finding something they liked. Curiosity, digging around, inverted the traditional retail model, and the very experience of shopping humbled the customer and created a fierce loyalty. That risk, the visceral thrill of breaking through perceived barriers, is like an avalanche that can propel and focus your creative energies and result in a design like no other. What is it that motivates us, designers all, to make decisions like that? A station stop on our creative journey, a process that can be as meaningful at a micro gestural scale as at a much larger one, all the way to the plans for a park or images for a video game. For us, we can say it's about the exhilaration of a breakthrough, finding the right combination of elements that feel right, that sometimes break new ground, but more often than not, simply fit snugly into a larger picture. And with that, we'd like to introduce ja Yasna and Noel, who will be giving the first presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Ming. And thanks everybody else. Um, <clears throat> those were really nice examples um, that were definitely resonating with me. Um, and I'm sure Yasna too. Um, a lot of those we look at or have looked at over the years as we've been growing and, and working together. And um, uh, you gave a very nice uh, introduction already um, about where we came from and uh, what we started in. Um, and I'll just add that uh, we, you know, at the time when we met, it was 2008. Um, at that point, we'd already decided our paths and that was in ceramics at the time. And, uh, and we met at a, uh, an artist residency in uh, Denmark and uh, it was a ceramics residency. And, uh, and right away we, we started collaborating together and, uh, and sharing ideas and doing things. And of course we fell in love too there. And, um, <laughs> and uh, so we spent a summer in Denmark, it was really nice. And, uh, and then uh, I was halfway through uh, grad school at the time and Yasna had her uh, professional ceramics practice in Vancouver. Uh, BC. And uh, so uh, after I finished school at RISD, I, I left the US, I guess for good. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I moved to Vancouver. And, uh, and then uh, we shared a studio there uh, on Granville Island, for those of you who are familiar with Vancouver. And um, we uh, continued our ceramics practices or individual ceramics practices. But um, we continued to have ideas between ourselves and, um, and over time those started to take form and, uh, and they had a kind of, uh, theme that, uh, they were fulfilling. And, um, after a while that, that in, in between work became more exciting for us, uh, than our personal practices. Our personal practices became at that point a little bit like a chore to upkeep. And uh, the in-between work was, was free from all of the parameters that we'd already decided for our styles and everything like that. And so um, that is how eventually uh, some time later in about 2012, our uh, official collaborative practice was born. And with that, I'll, I'll start, I'll share screen and uh, begin our talk. So we are, um, <clears throat> right now we are based in Montreal uh, in Canada. This is 
where we are at present. Yeah. And so. we work together under um, this name, Dear Human. Um, so, <clears throat> are we going to? So uh, some years after we met, we um, did another artist residency. Uh, this was in um, Alberta in, uh, in Canada. And it was at a place where it used to be um, a major ceramic uh, um, a, a factory and uh, there was a, a brick factory and uh, Highcroft was a, a dishes factory because they have a, a lot of um, clay um, in the ground. So uh, the, when, um, when everything halted in like 80s, I guess. It halted at the, when uh, trade, the um, uh, trade and changed between US and Canada and, and a lot of manufacturing went overseas. That's when it all started to go overseas. Uh, so basically the, the factories were um, overnight uh, uh, stopped working. And uh, uh, so um, there were uh, left with these boxes of plates and, and dishes that were just uh, abandoned. And when we did the residency, we had the opportunity to um, work with these dishes that somewhere boxed, somewhere like in piles somewhere. And we were working a lot with uh, images and transfer images on, on ceramics in different ways. So uh, it was the first time uh, for us to work with the material um, that was kind of abandoned and to revive that. And we had lots of fun and really uh, loved this uh, new concept. So that led to this project that um, was uh, um, commissioned by a, a place in uh, Vancouver and where we uh, went back to um, Medalta in the Madison Hat and uh, um, worked with uh, hundreds of plates to um, create uh, this uh, wall installation. I'll just say, I'll just add about the concept of this piece was that the, the it was a bank actually that was uh, asking for this piece and they wanted it to be something that would, it was a very diverse uh, community that this bank was located in, in, in uh, Burnaby in BC. And they wanted something that would tie the community together. So our, our idea was that it would be food. And so this is a representation of all different types of food from that area of the people that, of the demographic that was represented. So, um, and of course you'll see, you'll see Zora, this is our daughter Zora and our son Kolya in some of the photos uh, because they are always with us <laughs> at all times in our work and life. Um, so they are at the studio with us and in the middle of projects everywhere. So this is us um, uh, cleaning off plates and figuring out the mapping system of the, uh, of the project. So for this, we uh, made a custom decals and applied to um, uh, hundreds of plates, which we refired and, um, and um, uh, also some of these plates uh, um, and we uh, afterwards uh, had a, a small um, limited edition of uh, like a dinner plate inspired by this project and this became a custom for us to yeah. um, make a, like a souvenirs of uh, um, different projects that we have done. So like we would have an art project and sometimes we'd have a product that would come off of that or vice versa like we'd make a product and then an art project would come off of that. And so um, this is the, after we produced all the plates, we're installing it here. And then this is the, uh, at the bank, once it's installed. Um, and then that, that idea of working with uh, uh, recycled materials led us to this next project, which we called Patchwork in Canada. Um, in the, uh, at this point, uh, we, um, already received a grant from Canadian government to work on a, a 
larger kind of urban intervention project, something that we have done um, even before we met, we were doing uh, pro little projects uh, um, separately and then uh, also did a, a, a small run where we would leave, uh, uh, make and leave ceramic objects for people to find and kind of like discover. It, it was uh, always about discovery and um, interaction with uh, like invisible um, audience. So um, Petwork in Canada, we, um, learn about a, a, a farm in uh, just outside of Lisbon uh, where um, there was a, um, all this abandoned material basically. And so we pick up the family and went to Lisbon for a couple of months to um, develop this project. And these are some photos at, at the farm that we were repeatedly going to visit it was uh, uh, originally it was it was a really interesting place. It was owned by it was called Cortizo and Netosh, and it was uh, owned by an old man who collected the off off the or the finished uh, runs of different tile types. And he was the only business of its kind in in uh, Portugal. And so, if people broke some discontinued tiles, they would come to him and get uh, some other tiles to replace their kitchen tiles that were cracked. And uh, when he died, he bequeathed it to his grandchildren. And that was who we were working with to uh, produce this, this- uh, To collect the, uh -huh, the to, tiles. To collect the tiles. And, and so of course, here's our kids so, <laughs> uh, as we're packing tiles. So we um, uh, packed a, a bunch of boxes and shipped them back to Canada. And uh, uh, there, um, we worked on uh, on a mural on composition as well as on um, refiring some of the tiles. We made uh, decals or we um, uh, got some decals, uh, a, a gold decals to apply on some of the, the special tiles. And we also cut them all um, in four so that we have more um, material to tag. And, uh, um, um, then uh, this, the originally the mural was uh, uh, displayed at, um, in Toronto during a design festival, and uh, in, which is in January. And it, we were living in Vancouver at the time, so it was very, very cold in uh, um, Toronto at the time. And after the, uh, the mural was taken down, we started tagging uh, each of uh, each tile had a, a magnet in the back. And so we were leaving these uh, precious <laughs> uh, tiles um, all over the metal uh, surfaces uh, for um, people to find. And first we did it uh, in Toronto, then we traveled to um, Montreal and we uh, placed some there. And then um, finally we went back with some in Vancouver and we, um, left them around uh, in Vancouver as well. So this was a, uh, this was kind of um, uh, as well as promotional um, a project for us because we had a um, website and information in the back so people could find uh, and, and contact us and uh, let us know about their experience. Uh, when they were they found uh, uh, tiles. Uh -huh. And then um, the uh, afterwards we we made our composition into a wallpaper in collaboration with a, a Canadian wallpaper brand, and it's still available today. This is one version of it. We had a few different versions. This is the this is representing really close to our actual motif that we made on in the design week. And um, so this uh, working, uh, being in Lisbon and uh, especially in working with tiles made us kind of fall in love with uh, ceramic tiles and steered us into um, direction of um, making tiles ourselves, which wasn't something we have done in the past in our ceramic explorations. And um, 
at the same time of our uh, friends of ours, um, an architect and you know, jewelry designer in uh, Vancouver, where they were building um, a home and they asked us if we could uh, create tiles for um, their um, home for their all their um, bathrooms and, and uh, kitchen splash. And uh, uh, based on our um, aesthetic and a previous work, uh, they trusted us and gave us a kind of open uh, um, hand to uh, create and design uh, tiles and, and uh, um, different um, motifs. Mm -hmm. Only that uh, our, at that point, our studio, we um, were not set uh, for making tiles mm -hmm. at all. Yeah, so <clears throat> luckily, uh, just by chance, I or we had been exposed to one well-known uh, tile maker in, in BC who's from the UK originally. And uh, we, uh, he helped us along with the beginning of the process and we, we uh, custom built, as you can see, the, the red uh, hydraulic press on the side. We built that and we, we learned how to make uh, air release dyes and we started producing the tiles. And, um, and this is a little bit of that process of how how they were made so uh, we made we end up making uh over five thousand tiles yeah the the it grew from just like a bathroom to all the bathrooms to the kitchen to the laundry room to the the guest house and so on and so forth and in this process we developed uh, um, some um, different surfaces on, on tiles like uh um, um, these textured tiles and also um, silk screen tiles. And so um, those were like a, um, a special accents in, in the murals. Uh, this is just a, you can just see some elevations here to see how the mapping or the like mosaicing process was. So the top one is a, a master bath and um and then the the lower one was a, a, a powder room and um this is the house it's called rough house and here's the kitchen backsplash with textured tiles uh the powder room and you can see hand screen printed uh tiles here master bath um, uh, and also as a, a part uh, uh, um, of the tile making uh, um, for this house, we developed uh, uh, cross stitch tiles, we named them cross stitch, uh, uh, using uh, you know, cheap industrial tiles. This was like the more affordable and, um, and fun um, project that we have done that uh, the uh, Monica, uh, who is um, has a Hungarian background, and she wanted somehow to incorporate that story into uh, the the this mural. So we uh, worked with this motif, uh, referencing um, the embroidery and uh, that craft from um, from Hungary, but really from um, um, different Europe. East, mm -hmm. Eastern Europe. And uh, we um, made uh, uh, custom decals and um, refire tiles for this uh, motif. And this was uh, just a, another- um, Another one. And that's what the finished one looked like. And- uh, So during uh, uh, um, that, at that time we, um, had a studio within a garment factory. So when we left for uh, Lisbon, we closed our studio on, uh, um, on Granville Island and we knew that we will, will need a bigger space. And when we came back, um, it was um, hard to find with Vancouver real estate. It was tricky to find uh, a space and we, managed to uh, find this uh, um, a, a small factory that had some dead space and we arranged to 
um, make our kind of carve our studio space within. Um, only that um, uh, there were some parameters. There was a heater that was in the um, our part of the studio and we couldn't really build walls. So we had to work with that and with the um, a light that was only coming from one side. So we ended up creating these uh, fabric walls that um, was uh, um, uh, kind of letting the light in as well as the noise. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, this is where um, we, um, started um, witnessing um, what the, the, this process of um, uh, creating uh, um, clothing was uh, producing this huge waste of paper, which wasn't even recycled. It was just like uh, garbage because every time they were cutting patterns, uh, they were using layers of paper. And that's what uh, gave us uh, um, like inspiration to start to to think about uh, how this material can be uh, utilized so we asked them to like keep some aside for us and then the piles were kind of building up and in, in our corner of our studio space and finally we started using it and um and this was one of the first uh experiments that we made and uh we created uh, a tile using our own tile molds from ceramic tiles. Uh, and uh, it was a successful experiment. And we, we got very excited about this. And uh, so this is a, an example of like the first composition that we put together with, with these tiles. Also, it kind of turns out that uh, um, working with paper was in a way similar uh, the way we um, uh, were working with uh, uh, ceramics and uh, um, that we could use, it was, we were making tiles one by one, just how uh, we were making in ceramics, except it was much uh, slower than in, uh, with clay. And um, so um, we uh, got a, a, a first project that for a restaurant in Spain, uh, when we um, did an um, installation of tiles. And at that point, we were combining them with some of our ceramic tiles. And, um, and so this project got uh, um, uh, published and, and in a, a different uh, online magazines like uh, uh, Design Milk and Design Boom and Domus. And suddenly, um, we were getting all these um, inquiries and um, distributors and shipping and all of this um, interest for the new material because tiles weren't only um, um, aesthetically um, exciting, but they were um, uh, acoustic as well. So, um, so we um, needed to think about the production and uh, this is when we uh, did uh, um, this it was a, research. It was a grant with a, uh, an innovations company and um, they have a government funding to bridge industry uh, from uh, creatives to, to industrial partners in BC. And it's mostly in the pulp and wood industry. And so we got uh, granted uh, a proof of concept project to work with them to uh, scale our production methods, which they laughed at and they said it's like watching horse and buggy and so we um so we scaled it or actually they they had a hard time figuring it out too because it didn't exist in the world yet and so we got kind of half of the solution with that that project um and uh, so you can see there uh just just kind of the beginning of an idea and then um you know, time goes by, we, we continue collecting paper. There's Zora, uh, she's very used to being included in a heap of bags of paper in the car. Uh, so throughout our uh, work with paper, we uh, work exclusively with uh, um, recycled paper. We 
um, we're uh, collecting uh, um, lots of paper from architectural company, all the plants that we were shredding ourselves, which was, so we got like some big shredders for this, but also then we got some connections to a school, to different places where we were um, able to collect their recycled paper, which wasn't an easy task. And uh, at this time, we were experimenting with other shapes, um, but each of the each of the um, the shapes were, you know, like still one by one made. Um, but at one point, we did uh, we worked with some innovators uh, here in Montreal after we moved here, and uh, we figured out to use our old hydraulic press, and um, and so we sped up the process. We stopped using the, the old dies that we used to use. Um, but it was still a one by one process and uh, and we we're still using like these single shaped dies, which was a kind of limiting factor, but we were also exploring uh, different paper colors and types and um, and uh, dyeing techniques. And at this time we we uh, had already shown this in we'd shown it in Milan, we'd shown it in New York, uh, in Vancouver and Toronto, but finally. Uh, we went to Sweden and what, during that show, we, we just kind of had this turning point idea or re realization that we needed to scale this and make it a separate thing. And so when we came back home from Sweden, we made Paper Tile, a, a separate company, um, and we scaled the uh, production um, so that we were making panels instead of uh, tiles and we acquired a CNC machine and um, we, we beefed up our press so that we could press larger uh, pieces. But also we um, kind of decided what the format of this uh, um, um, well is going to be that we can take bigger projects but we are not uh, going to uh, cover like an airport uh, um, wings and because uh, in the meantime we over the years we kept receiving these uh, inquiries for variety of uh, projects and and some very big and because uh, uh, this was a, a, a in acoustic uh, material um, section nice. and and uh, we decided that uh, we will still we will work with um uh, rather than acoustic walls, we'll work with the functional art uh, murals. And so um, sometimes this was uh, our assistant, we had to get uh, some more paper and worked with the um, recycle company. At this point, we got a ton of paper. Um, and so just some of the projects that mm -hmm. came from that. And then here we have a, uh, we'll just show here, these are just some of the different projects that uh, we did and uh, we'll show a little, a short little video about that now, showing the process of them. But you can see what the CNC allowed us to diversify the shapes. So here's the... <laughs> We started working with paper in our previous studio that was in a garment factory. There was all this waste from the cutting process, so we asked to use some of the paper to run some experiments. The experiments were successful after the first try. It was very exciting. Paper tile was our first prototype, and the result was very different from anything that we have seen on the market, and that gave us a boost to explore the medium further. In our design practice, we are interested in material exploration and sustainability as well as creating objects that would tell stories and be joyful to have around. 
So in a single day, you can begin with a piece of paper and then you're shredding it, pulping it, and then forming it into a mold. And it's amazing to see this transformation take place from a waste material into a new, interesting looking object at the end of it. So the things that we make carry with them the story of their creation because it's really evident that they are made from an unusual material and if somebody has one of these pieces in their house it's going to be a point of conversation where it came from and what it's made of and those customers become part of that sustainability story. Okay, so that's paper tile. And meanwhile, other things were happening. Uh, that, so that paper tile was just kind of going off in one direction and we continued to explore with paper and other materials uh, at the same time. So you wanna talk about this one? So um, one of our um, interest is the uh, crafts from um, like traditional crafts from different you know, parts of the world. And uh, after we traveled to Serbia and visited for a hundred time the um, ethnography museum in Belgrade, uh, we uh, were inspired by uh, these um, quirky um, old stools that were mostly in villages and, and and we started a, a series of stools uh, that uh, inspired by um, these ethno stools. And the uh, first one was a milking stool. Uh, it's this one where we use the uh, paper um, uh, more as a sculpting um, material. And then we continue um, making these stools and, and uh, until um, now, <laughs> so we these are more recent uh, uh, ones that we um, are using uh, now paper panels that are cut and glued together to create these different uh, shapes. So just like further uh, exploration in paper as well. And then um, our interest in, uh, in uh, working with uh, 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 hand, yeah, hand, hand crafts and, and, and kind of world traditions led us back to Mexico. We had, had some experience in Mexico before and we were really uh, in love with uh, that country and the people and culture. And uh, we were really fortunate to be invited to this, um, this project called Vision and Tradition, which was run by Design Week Mexico. And uh, what it did was it paired designers with um, different uh, pr producers that worked with the artisans and the idea was that they would be producing uh, a, a new format or object that would be in the contemporary uh, world of design and so uh, we it was a really fast uh, program we had like about 24 hours to come up with two uh, design ideas that the the artisan would produce um, and in three months and then show in, in Mexico City at uh, the um, Museum of Anthropology uh, during design week. And so uh, we, after watching the artisan work and we, we were really interested in the, um, the showing the, the different techniques that you could uh, uh, create using this material, which is by the way, it's called chuspata and it's, uh, it's a wetland grass that um, uh, grows in Michoacan state. And this is uh, petate uno, petate dos, which are two different types of weaving styles. And so we made a foldable screen that was really just to represent all these different uh, uh, weaving techniques. And um, 
And you want to talk about that one? And uh, and uh, the second uh, um, design where um, these stools um, inspired by um, some work that we have uh, uh, done before in different materials, but also um, the we learned that all of the chuspata has this uh, uh, frame and um, structure underneath, and we want to kind of expose this uh, um, part of the process. And so we made mm -hmm. these um, to the bone mm -hmm. uh, stools, which uh, uh, were produced uh, afterwards. Mm -hmm. And here's at the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. Uh, one of the greatest museums, and uh, it was in the in the lobby. It was the uh, funnest, uh, uh, one of the funnest projects we have done, and it was very exciting to meet a uh, Mexican um, crew. Um, so, mm -hmm. um, this uh, in the meantime, we were uh, exploring uh, different applications of paper. And, uh, um, and sculpting with paper was uh, uh, one of the um, techniques. So then we developed the, uh, these kind of like sculptural forms that um, were uh, shown in, uh, uh, as installations or different exhibitions. And uh, um... uh, so we, since we, we are often like working in, uh, like on sculptural things, and then they have offshoots that go into um, design and vice versa. We decided to make a whole series of objects that seem to be uh, functional or not, but actually functional if they weren't or something like that. So we were just kind of riding the line between design and art. And then it, it uh, we had a few different shows showing this type of work and, um, and it led to these kind of uh, totem-like things that um, uh, the offshoot became tea tables. And uh, these are uh, paper table slash stools that um, are usually presented in, in groups. And um, they're all kind of one-offs, which is really the way we and work. Kind of, but functional. But they're tables. functional too. Yeah, they're functional. And... Um, mm -hmm. Um, and also we um, want to show these um, um, variety of concepts that we um, worked on that we are inspired by our personal needs, as well as our kind of need to um, play with work. And uh, so um, this uh, uh, sweet seat was one of the first uh, um, that we designed that idea was that um, you have a, a different uh, chairs around that you can quickly um, um, open into beds for guests uh, or for forts for kids mm -hmm. and um, and um, you can have one or more and uh, um, there's no structure it's very simple concept and afterwards, uh, we um, had a, a soft draft with a similar um, idea that opens up into, and we have these at home and are... Um, and they're wonderful. We use them <laughs> all the time. We sleep on them. We, it's, it's great. So uh, both bench is a, a bench that we produced for our, our studio. Um, and uh, it was, the idea was we were in the garment factory, so we were... Uh, and we were working with fabric at the time. And so we were just storing our extra fabric on these rods. And it also conveniently made a, a cozy back cushion to lean on. And um, this is hangaraki. Um, it is a, a hanging swinging rack. Uh, we wanted to have something fun in our bathroom for our bathroom mirror. And, uh, and we didn't really see anything out there that, that did towels. that for towels. Yeah. And so that was that idea. Uh, this is a room, another room divider that um, we call plaid, that um, when they stack together, the overlapping panels create uh, a, new, um, a new pattern. Uh, and so they can be 
all one type or they can be multiple different types. And they're just using the same simple materials that we use a lot of, the, the dowels, the um, elastics and, um, and fabric. And uh, this is kind of uh, with the last group of work that we wanted to talk about, which are um, module lamps. Um, these we've been working on for years in different iterations. And uh, they, they started out as, as porcelain lamps. They were inspired by this uh, um, stackable uh, wooden toy that we uh, had since uh, um, Koi was little. And so uh, inspired by that, we started these lamps first making with um, porcelain and combination of porcelain and paper rock. And the, the components are interchangeable. You could have lots of extra components and make different lamps out of them and switch them around. That was showing the, the inner uh, tube that the electrical goes through. So very simple design that over time, uh, we um, continue playing with, with the different uh, um, uh, shapes and formats to, mm. that can be stacked. This is in another material uh, this is a very large one that is in a material we developed called paper rock, which is a hardened version of our paper that we can cast with. Here's some of the components like that. And then just like the stools that we showed earlier, this is a, these are recent forms of uh, using the um, paper, paper tile panels to cut custom components with and make all sorts of like infinite different lights with, with all the individual components. And so they slowly gravitated into these that are like full circle back to the actual toy that it was inspired by and their totems. And this is our, some of our most recent um, obsession and we're still working on these today. Mm -hmm. and Except that these are um, not, these are like a, a much larger um, size. So, um. mm -hmm. then the toys that we uh -huh. began with. And here's Zora nine years later. And here's our, uh, so a little bit of our studio space is our office part of our studio, showing some of the objects around. some of our workspace and that's it. Thank you so much. That nice. was a wonderful presentation. Thanks very much. <laughs> Flickers of, of, you know, all kinds of creative cousins that, <laughs> that yeah. you've generated. Um, Ming and I were being very. And you absolutely have so much fun. You can you can just yeah. see the joy and the playfulness and all of your work. It's really beautiful. It's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I think everybody had a good time. <laughs> Thank you. So I think we move directly into a uh, a I presentation, right? Is that right? We yes. No, I think. Uh, I think there's a question. We can have time for a Q&A right now. So if anybody oh, wants to put their good. questions in the chat, yeah, just while, while these guys are top of mind, we love to um, have a conversation. And um, if anybody has any questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, and if not, we can get to you at the, the end of tonight as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll start off with a question. Um, you guys, uh, you know, talked at the beginning about, you know, starting off with uh, as ceramic artists, but then um, you said when you no longer looked at yourself as ceramic artists, that it just sort of broke the barriers. Um, I was, that was kind of a neat idea and, you know, obviously maybe kind of changed your lives. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, yeah, that that was uh, that was sort of interesting. We uh, we did 
I mean, we were very passionate about ceramics and we were very comfortable with that material. And, but um, our in-between work really didn't have much to do with ceramics. Although the ceramics community did embrace us continually as years went by after we completely left the material <laughs> and they would often invite us back to talk about stuff, even though we weren't working in ceramics anymore. But, um, but yes, there was just a point in time where uh, we realized that our, we had to just follow our, our excitement. And so our excitement was going into other unknown territory. And, um, and so that's what we did. And, and, uh, and I suppose in some regard, we still consider ourselves ceramic artists, you know, at heart, but uh, we really, uh, now it's just like, we can work with anything. We, we did, it was a kind of a liberation um, and a kind of time of expansion where we weren't limited by what ceramics can do because that is quite limiting, mm -hmm. so. We have a really interesting question from Nick Baran, and I wonder if Nick, would you like to come on and ask a question? Sure. I'm um, sorry, I can't use my video right now because I'm on my phone, but um, I was just curious, you guys spoke so passionately about different materials, um, you know, going from ceramics and then um, leading into fabrics, wallpaper, and then, then finding paper. I was wondering if there's any materials that you're itching to dive into now that you've more established, have more resources at your hands. Well, um, we, uh, we didn't uh, go into our explorations in plastics, but we did explore a little bit in recycled plastics so far, just with more recently. Um, there's definitely interest there. Textile. Textile, absolutely. Yeah, like, and oh, and rugs. If we, you know, get an opportunity to work with rug makers, I think that we'd have a lot to explore there. So we would hope to do that in Mexico. Um, but we are waiting for mm -hmm. um, like that to come our way because we still like to work. We are really, it's so unsatisfactory to revive materials. The, and so um, we are still waiting for that opportunity to come. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, there's a question about uh, production time from Eddie Vidal, uh, Vidales. Mm -hmm. Eddie, do, do, would you like to ask a question or would you prefer that I read it? Oh, hi. Yes. Um, my question wasn't about production time, but if um, I'm happy to ask a question if that's okay. Yes. Sure. Yes. Go ahead. So um, I was just really impressed about how open you guys seem to be to taking in um, different forms of inspiration. So I was just wondering if there were anything that you sort of ignited some inspiration, but that didn't lead somewhere. Like, how do you kind of suss out what's going to be the most... Um, productive for you? Yeah, that's that's interesting uh, question, Eddie, because when we're putting together this presentation, we had to omit 80% of <laughs> our explorations, you know, so to make it look coherent because our explorations go in all sorts of different directions. And so we do often like try something out or we get materials for something to try something, but we don't try it right away. And then years later, we come back and then try it finally. And so there's always these loose strings around. And that's just a part of uh, the creative process that a studio is just loaded full of uh, all sorts of ideas that are either never going to be completed or maybe one day. Um, and the, I guess your question is like, how do we choose? We just like go with the excitement. The excitement has to lead us, I guess. And, and what seems fun? Like if it seems like a chore, uh, we probably won't ever complete it. So uh, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> no. Yeah. That, that is such a great answer to it. You know, if it's not exciting and fun, you just like move on to the next until, and 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 basically you just just you just have let all of those ideas percolate in the back of your mind, and and then sometimes they resurface, and mm -hmm. and I think part of uh, I think part of a creative act is always about you know 
uh, tried and errors, you know, and it's like, it's never about failure. If it doesn't work, you just go on to the next and then maybe you come back to it and, and, and combine those ideas, different ideas together and maybe a different combination would yield to a much more successful uh, uh, product. So, but but I, I love the fact that that unless there is an excitement out of it, like you would, so you you would never be bored all your life. I could okay. just see that in your family, you, you know, there's no boredom allowed. Yes. That's one of the greatest. <laughs> boredom. Yeah. Yeah. I was just gonna say that's one of the greatest perks of, of our career path is that, you know, that's that's kind of the leading factor and it's not, we, I mean, sometimes, yes, we have commissions and we do those, and but we try to make those exciting too. And, uh, and, um, and sometimes we turn things down if they're not exciting, so. So um, I, I, um, I have to apologize for Menia because I think, I think that was a, di a different question which has to do with turnaround time. So Menia, if mm. you would like to ask a question because I think you had that question up quite early. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, that's a sort of a boring question at this point. <laughs> uh, but, but looking at all this, I got, obviously, it, it, it feeds into each other. So I got inspired. And, and because I work, we work in world of architecture, always work with tight deadlines and budgets and all that. So can you tell us how does that work from your end? Like, uh-huh. Like that wall, for example, that you, one of the walls with paper tile you showed mm -hmm. in a conference room or something, what would be a typical turnaround time for something like that? How does yeah, that for, uh, Yeah, I can answer that. Um, for, uh, for like a, let's say, let's say a medium sized wall, which I would call, uh, you know, nine feet high by maybe 15 feet long, something like that. Uh, we can do the design. The design process is always happening at the same time as the production. So if we figure out what the tile type is and that, then we kind of go forward with that. And then we're designing, um, designs complete, then we go into the finishing. And then um, a, a project like that, we could probably turn around, you know, in four to six weeks, you know, something like that. Something else as long as there's nothing like if we're working on several projects at the same time it's different of course but um and then for a larger wall like some of the bigger walls that you saw um that's a it's a long process uh the designing takes a lot of a lot of effort and um so we try to have a long design runway for that um just to get it right and uh, get everybody happy and then um production we always try to have stock, so. Well, we usually don't have <laughs> any stock <laughs> well, of anything. <laughs> we, we always try, yeah, for, for objects, yes, but for paper tile, we always try to have like some dry stock and then we'll go into the wet work at the same time, but we already have dry stock to cut while the wet work is happening. So it's kind of uh, all happening at the same time. Um, and then, you know, the short answer for a big wall like that would be like six months or something. Well, four to six months, you know. Yeah, a really big wall. I guess uh, uh, we, we did one time uh, do 11 walls uh, for one place and like 5,000 tiles or something like that, or I can't remember how many, and it was in four months and we almost died doing it. So we would never do it again because we, we learned our lesson, you know, that, that it's just not worth it, so. But we had help, it yeah, wasn't just us. <laughs> uh, so we just have uh, uh, time for maybe a more, more one more question, a very, very short question. And I think it has to do with color. So uh, Sergio. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my question was uh, because I guess um, when I think about uh, like a creative like Zaha Hadid or Louise Berrigan in their architecture, they I guess Zaha Hadid she used a lot of white color, which a lot of her uh, buildings look a little bit futuristic in that sense. And Louise Berrigan with his color was he used a lot of bright color. So I wanted to I saw a lot of your projects and there was a lot of 
uh, a lot of white, a lot of those primary colors, pink, but there was, they were kind of in shades. I want to know, was there a reason for that? Or was it just because of the natural, like the natural state that came with the material? You should answer. Uh, I color. guess there, there is a, it's definitely not the natural state of material. It's more like, um, um, <laughs> it's more a need for color. <laughs> yeah. And you know, like our, um, especially for me, inspiration comes from like, uh, places that are very colorful and and um, like Mexico and Spain and you know and that's where we go to um, get inspired and mm -hmm. and uh, um, being here especially in the winter like mm -hmm. uh, we need uh, um, to have colorful work to yeah. keep us alive we love Baragan's uh, <laughs> architecture and have visited several yeah. in uh, Mexico and uh and definitely we we often think about I mean we we kind of since we don't live in Mexico at least right now uh we try to bring Mexico into our work a lot and in our home because our work is everywhere in our house every practically everything in our house is made by us so that's cool yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I guess um, now it's time for us to um, move on to uh, the next session. Yep. Go for it. Okay, so now we're ready to uh, start with our uh, second presenter. Um, and um, I'm so very excited to uh, uh, to have Carmen Zella um, give us a lot of insight about how uh, she has been uh, working with creative people because of her interdisciplinary background, as well as, um, and it has to be like her creative force in order to have, work with all of this uh, collaborative um, aspect of putting artists and, and other people, agency and developers uh, together. So um, I'd like to um, give the uh, floor to Carmen. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. Um, thank you so much Ming and Craig for the introduction and the invitation to speak this evening at the Creativity Conference. Um, we're just gonna queue up our keynote. Um, one second. Okay. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Super. So um, my name is Carmen. I'm the founder and creative director of Now Art. Um, I really love this year's theme of blurring boundaries. In many ways, it reflects my journey and my philosophy as an art consultant and, um, and an art curator. So tonight I was asked to explore some of my creative energy and my motivations. So I'm going to do a presentation, but I really want to um, address some of the highlight topics my creative inspiration as an art consultant, trends and the future of public art, um, my role as an art consultant um, and as part of the team, um, you know, because there's a lot of architects and, and developers on the, on the Zoom. And then I'm gonna end with the why now before opening it up to Q&A. So um, a little bit about me. So imagine London, England, 1999. I had just arrived in, um, in England and I was working um, at the Peter Brook um, Royal Court Theater upstairs after journeying through the Middle East. Um, as a, a Canadian, I was able to um, get my uh, work visa to work in London. And this was a really exciting time for me. Um, both because I was working at Peter Brooks Theater and I'm a huge, a, a lot of Peter Brooks work I'm hugely inspired by, but also because I was a theater critic. So this particular performance 
um, really sort of changed the course of my life. And this was a performance of De La Guarda. It was their opening premiere in London, England of a production called Vila Vila. And what was extraordinary about this particular um, performance was that it was produced in East London uh, in a warehouse. So an unconventional location, all of the audience came into a room, they were all standing and you know, London theater audiences, you know, the women were in these incredible gowns and the men were dressed up in beautiful suits and the performance started and all of a sudden these um, performers were all on bungee cords and they literally came down from the ceiling. It rained on everyone. And the feeling that we got from leaving this theater house in, it wasn't even a theater house, it was a warehouse in East London was extraordinary. And that moment was really pivotal for me. And you can see that this was produced by Roundhouse. It was quoted as good as sex. It was pretty darn good, um, but it really changed the course of how I approached art and looked at art moving forward. This was really the foray into physical theater. And from that moment, I decided that I wanted to go back to school and take interdisciplinary fine art. So I went back to Canada, and went to Concordia University and started the practice there. So, um, you know, this sort of like segues into the blurring boundaries um, uh, subject matter. So blurring boundaries in interdisciplinary art is really at the heart of the practice. And this is sort of as an art consultant um, and a curator working in public art, it's constantly about blurring boundaries. So my studies in Concordia University as an interdisciplinary student were um, really enriched by learning about anthropology and then segueing that into art practice or learning about theology and segueing that into art practice. And so the image that you see in the back is of the Triforium, which was a sculpture by Joseph Young. Um, it was uh, first envisioned in Los Angeles in the Civic Center in 1975. And it was the very first polyphenoptic sculpture um, ever to um, be positioned in the world. What polyphenoptic means is that it's the segue between light and sound. So I was blessed enough to work on uh, a project that brought the Triforium back to life because of course in 1975, they didn't have the technology that we have now. Um, and so we reactivated it um, as part of my portfolio in the last few years. But to go back to the interdisciplinary practice, um, that is something that I think is at the cross section. And um, it's, you know, and you're going to hear me say this a lot in this talk. I believe that public art has a, a, a long runway. We have a lot of exploration that we can move forward in. Um, and it's going to continuously be about this cross section of art and technology um, and, different, um, and, and different types of disciplines and conventions that will make it continue to be this exciting exploration that I believe it to be. Um, so looking at multi multiple vantage points, pushing the boundaries of art has always been the undercurrent of my practice. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, desire, love, and failure, because I think this is really at the heart of um, creative growth. And, and this is really what fuels um, my creative process. So I wanted to give a couple of pivotal examples of work that's influenced my perspective. Um, these examples have given me deeper insight beyond the art itself and learnings and understandings and importance of cultural relevance, the power of art in conversations, activations that enlist all of the senses and pushing boundaries and the imagination. Um, so failure is obviously a part of that because, um, you know, we learn a lot from failure. So starting from this, the image on the left, um, desire. So in 2012, I flew to Cairo, Egypt to meet the street artists that led the creative force propelling the Arab Spring. Um, on the rooftop of the Italian consulate. Some of these artists, you know, um, have since, you know, uh, moved to the United States. Uh, Genzir, Ayaterek, 
Ala Awad, Amir Bakar. These are really phenomenal artists because they put themselves on the line um, creating work in the streets when there was no news outlet, there was no media and their work really helped to inspire community um, as muralists. It informed community as muralists um, and their work has had this real, really strong legacy. Um, and there was a lot of artists that were young female artists that were a part of that um, conversation. And so that was, that was really a, an exciting time because I'd already been working in public art at that time. And so to see um, how um, public art was inspiring uh, an entire political movement was something that was uh, really something that I couldn't miss. So I flew to Egypt and, and, and met with them. It was an unbelievable experience. Love, so whether you like Burning Man art or not, <laughs> I had to put this one in here because it's Burning Man for me, um, I went in 2001 and um, you know, soon after uh, I, uh, I ended up in Los Angeles because I got a Conseil des Arts grant um, to work on uh, when I was an interdisciplinary student to work on experimental video with physical theater myself. And I showcased that at, um, at the brewery Art Lofts um, around the same time. So, but during the time that I was coming to do that project, I went to Burning Man and I really experienced a 60,000 people in an urban landscape, you know, coming together fueled by creativity. And it was a sense of freedom because it's an experiment, right? It's the largest city in Nevada for 10 days and you really get to see if you're immersed um, in that city how an urban landscape that is completely suspended and fueled by creativity the energy that you get from that experience was one that was very captivating so every time i think about you know urban planning or placing creativity in an urban landscape um, i always kind of echo this utopian reality that is this um, suspended utopian reality that is Burning Man for those 10 days. Um, and then to talk a little bit about failure, I have really large ideas. Um, as an art curator and an art consultant, I think you know pushing the boundaries of large ideas is, is a part of what I bring to the table in conversations. Um, and sometimes those, you know, let's face it, like I've, I've learned a lot from my, my failures over time. One of the projects that I was really excited about and I put a lot of energy behind was this idea of the sirens. The sirens was, um, there's these old utilities that were put into place in Los Angeles in, uh, after World War II and they were air raid sirens. Um, and they were basically, you know, um, for impending air raids. And in the 80s, they were um, dis, you know, they, they went out of dis, went out of use. And so now they're sort of, you know, disregarded. And there's 200 of them and they dot the, the landscape of Los Angeles. And I thought, wouldn't that be an amazing sound art project to incorporate these sirens um, for performance and dance and theater and, you know, the sort of radio. So anyways, um, it was a very abstract idea. But what happened was when it never got off the ground after a few years of trying, um, it segued into the LA Phil, picked it up um, with an opera company called The Industry. And we co-produced uh, an adaptation of War of the Worlds by Orson Welles. Um, Sigourney Weaver was the voice of Orson Welles. And it was a, uh, we repurposed three of the air raid sirens in downtown Los Angeles. And uh, it was a, an opera that happened in multi locations at the same time simultaneously at Disney Concert Hall. So it uh, ended up segueing into something that was quite lovely. Um, so just a touch point on my creative inspiration. So I find creative inspiration all around me um, in and out of the art industry. I feel that my role as an art curator and as an art consultant is to really get out there and see what's out there in the world. So, you know, the talk um, earlier with uh, Noel and Yasna, you know, amazing artists. I do a lot of um, studio visits, but I really like to um, have my finger on the pulse of art movements and see what current trends are. So 
I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I see as future trends in public art, but the future of public art has yet to be seen. Um, art is evolution, art is dynamic. It evolves as people evolve. When you think about the value of public art, and this is something that I talk to developers and investors about quite often, um, you know, architecture and art when paired together and when in sync with each other really create a landmarks in our urban landscape. And these landmarks are really what I, uh, what wakes me up in the morning, what I, what I, um, you know, hope to achieve over time. And, and I still feel like there's a lot of, of runway for me in my career um, yet to come. So I, I really look at outside of the box and for artists who are leading the way, um, because we look back on art to define us historically. So we need visionary thinkers, artists, artists in many different sectors to push us forward. Um, and we see that across the board in sectors um, you know, outside of just the traditional art experience. And then of course, I have to put a picture in of my child because you guys put pictures in of your children. <laughs> no, my creative inspiration is my daughter. Um, and, and in all seriousness, it's really about the future generations, right? So what we're doing um, right now in our time, we have to think about how are we inspiring these future generations? And so I really look at my practice, art and creativity as helping to inspire and create the roadway for these future generations and these future artists to really um, explore. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about where I see public art heading and the future of public art. You know, this is like basically a value add. There's sources of inspiration. So art and tech, mental health and well-being, diversity, disruption, love that word, and collaboration. Um, so art and tech, let's talk about that for a little bit. This was a project um, that I did called Portal and um, the client came to me and asked to create, you know, in a very uh, dark hallway that went from um, the exterior uh, street into an interior retail uh, courtyard. They wanted to be able to draw people into that courtyard and it actually became one of the most popular Instagram sites. So then they had the issue of how do we get people out of <laughs> this courtyard? Cause everyone's using it for a backdrop for film and I don't know, video or whatever, but anyways. So in this particular instance, you know, when you walk inside, it's about technology and art is really about the physical. So as we've seen through this experience of the pandemic, there was a cultural void. Artists didn't have um, the ability to showcase their work, um, access their audience. A lot of it went online. We saw the proliferation of NFTs as a result of this. But what we're about to see is like the roaring 20s. People are coming back. They really want the physical experience. And I still think that technology has a place for this in terms of enhancing the physical experience. So it doesn't need to be one or the other, but I think that there's a really beautiful marriage. And as a public art curator, I'm often, um, you know, um, saddled with the, the responsibility of maintenance. And I think those things, I, I really believe that those things can be worked out. I mean, look at Joseph Young's project with the Triforium, for example, he did not have the technology, he had the foresight and the vision and our technology now, when we're going back to restore pieces like that, can really support um, those types of projects even further. So technology, as it evolves, can also help to create and evolve the artist's vision, even if it doesn't fully support it in the, at this moment in time. So um, I'm going off on another bar and I should really look at my notes. But anyways, I mean, this is, this is what I wanted to say in terms of art and tech. And then obviously, um, I have a great example of how art and tech was done as a case study. So again, as a public art curator, um, I felt a level of responsibility over the course of the pandemic and that artists did not have a voice. So um, this really um, propelled my need to do a project. Um, and this particular project was called Luminex. This was a, a showcase in downtown Los Angeles to help 
us, you know, as a community get through a transitional period coming out of the pandemic and allow culture and art to have a voice. And it was how, um, housed in the South Park District of Los Angeles because it was a phenomenal um, location, both because there was a lot of innovation and technology in terms of the residents and the streets there, but also logistically large walls within walkable distance to each other. So the artists, one part of this project that I feel is very important to note is when I was curating the artists, they were all local artists, um, but I was curating them because of their diversity within the medium of video art and digital art. So some of the artists brought AR to the table. Some of the artists had an immersive experience. Some of the artists, their work was really um, uh, dictated with um, narrative and, and storytelling was really the driving factor. Some other artists work was um, a derivative of data. Um, and, and so it was an amalgamation of data and some other artists work was multi-channel on two sides of, of a building and other works were live. They were live feeds with dancers and the audience actually interacting in, in that live space. So there was what I wanted to try and, and showcase as a curator and the reason that I selected these artists was um, because I really wanted to, I believe that digital art has a, um, a lot of possibilities, both within architectural landscape and also um, just in urban landscape uh, itself. And there's, um, you know, partners like Panasonic can really, you know, help to bring the museum quality out into the streets. So through the course of doing this project, you know, it was it was um, very difficult and challenging because um, because of some of the um, things that were happening uh, during the pandemic at that time, but it brought 15,000 people onto the streets of Los Angeles in a very respectful way and became this incredible case study and showcase of the power of public art. So I just wanna show um, a little video on the project. Can you guys hear that? Okay, so um, so just to sort of um, conclude with art and tech, uh, you know, AR, VR, NFTs, you know, I just, my takeaway for this um, particular point is just that digital art is only gonna get um, bigger from here. So this is a really um, incredible moment, both for public art and for digital art and digital artists. Um, why is mental health a source of inspiration? And why do I see this as, um, you know, continuing in terms of public art trends um, for the future. Uh, the healing power of art, you know, that was seen in an extraordinary fashion at Luminex because we had a pause and then showcasing this work with 15,000 people. It was an overwhelming response that we got from the public about this is the first time I've been out. I feel like I'm having a drink of water after being in a cultural desert. You know, and also too for the artists to be able to um, re-express themselves. So the the there's a um, a project that's happening called We Rise in Los Angeles, and it's being fully supported by the Department of Mental Health. And it's a series of installations around the city, and it just goes to show how it's uh, a, such an obvious link between mental health and also um, and art in um, in itself. This was a project that we did with the um, Los Angeles County of Art, as well as the Los Angeles um, County of Mental Health. And this is actually a full installation um, in Skid Row at their uh, mental health clinic. And um, if you know anything about Los Angeles, Skid Row is really ground zero for um, houseless people. And this clinic serves some of the um, most affected in terms of schizophrenia and, and really strong ailments. So what, we were tasked with as what I was tasked with as a public art curator was really to find a project that would not be a trigger. So we looked at things like color 
um, faces, how eyes were positioned. And we framed it as a bird forest because a bird forest um, is one of the most healing, the sounds of birds are, are incredibly healing and um, serene. And it deinstitutionalized. it took some of those harsh corridors um, by putting all of these birds in the bird forest. We also peppered in um, uh, the Declaration of Human Rights, um, which is screen printed in the background as well as these little um, infusions. And it was um, created by an African-American artist, um, Ali Timbuktu, um, who's a local artist uh, who really worked closely with the clinicians at the Department of Mental Health um, to fulfill the, the requirements of this project. Um, why is, uh, oh, and then also some of the takeaways from, from Luminex as well. So um, why is diversity a source of inspiration? So now more than ever, diversity is important. And when you're thinking about an urban landscape or public art, you really need to understand all sectors of society and speak to them. So when we're looking at site specificity, creating projects that speak to the community, we're reaching past ourselves to bring other people into the conversation and understand their connection. It's a really a bridge of bringing us closer together rather than pulling us apart. Um, this was a project that was the first ever public art activation in South Central um, with uh, Black Lives Matters and Trap Heels. And it was a greenhouse that was created. And it was a project that was meant to talk about um, art and, and uh, the judicial system. So the phone booths were actually people that are, are currently incarcerated and you were able to listen to their stories, um, their loved ones talking about them and their stories. And then um, you were also able to connect with them um, if you pressed the third. Um, so it was really like a, a project that was meant to drive art and healing with a deeper understanding of um, uh, the judicial system and art and justice. Um, we also worked with um, an artist from Mexico on, on the um, issues of immigration. And uh, he had created, his name is Alfredo Libre, and he created these coyotes um, all throughout Mexico. And he traveled the rail system and found out where on the rail system, the intersection points of my, uh, people that were migrating from South America to North America, where those um, intersections were. And he created the coyotes with information on them about, um, you know, there was a map because a lot of them have lost their cell phones and practical information, which with numbers of social services and places that would supply them with water, food, shelter, etc. And so these coyotes peppered all throughout Mexico, all the way up uh, through Tijuana. Um, and we felt it was really important to also have one outside of Union Station in Los Angeles. And so we um, commissioned him to come to Los Angeles with the Museum of Social Justice and actually place uh, one of them there. And so again, it's this issue of um, diversity and, and creating projects that really speak to community and also speak to and ignite conversations within communities. That's really um, an incredible and vital and, and important role that a public art curator and uh, public art consultant um, plays. Disruption. So why is disruption a source of inspiration? Well, it's a constant source of inspiration to me um, because I love how art uh, just repositions us and pivots us. And I could just go on and on about the artists that I'm inspired from in my life. But um, the, the heart of it is really innovation, giving people something that they need before they know they need it or before they know they want it. Um, and who are the artists that are leading in this disruption? There's many of them and they go from emerging artists, local artists um, like Amanda Gordon, the poet who spoke at the um, Biden's inauguration um, to Terrell who uses art and light and um, to um, Ai Weiwei who's a you know, incredible um, political art disruptor to you know, legendary um, artists like Noah Purfoy um, who's found objects in 29 Palms, you know, African-American artist, um, incredible works. He's created an entire museum. Um, and before he uh, died, I had the chance to, to go and see it before the desert started to 
take it back. And it, and it's just like these conversations um, and these disruptors are, are really um, bridging, um, um, you know, conversations in museums and galleries. And so what I, you know, feel is really important in public art is to bring these conversations, these, these disruptors and be a bridge. So as an art consultant and a art curator, I wanna be able to make the landscape of public art um, more accessible to artists. Um, because a lot of times in, in many conversations that I have with artists, you know, when they're working with me, it's their first time working in public art. And I think when I'm involved in projects, I feel like those projects are best served when I bring artists in um, who may feel intimidated about the public art landscape. There's so many considerations, you know, there's the fact that it's outside and there's the unknown. Um, there's permitting, there's working in collaborative teams with developers, architects, construction. Um, and so what I like to consider myself as is, is to be that bridge, to create that safe space and to oversee all of the aspects of the, the experience for these artists so that they can um, continue their work and continue these conversations and really make them accessible to the greater public, not just the museum crowd, not just the curatorial, uh, you know, echelon of the um, gallery institutions, but really, um, really make shifts in our in our urban landscape. Um, collaboration. So, uh, I'm showing this uh, particular slide. This is an artist, uh, Judith Hernandez. Um, she's an incredible, very famous um, Chicano artist, Chicana artist um, in Los Angeles. Um, this particular project at La Plaza um, won an AIA Building Team of the Year Award. Um, and so I wanted to share this when I'm talking about collaboration. So as an art consultant, um, you know, my participation in a team of architects, developers, um, investors is really to um, work uh, and work with that team really have the conversations early on, position um, artwork inside of the architectural um, visions so that they're not, you know, sort of um, afterthoughts or sort of inserted because there's a, a public art requirement. But we really see the value of the art because it's being showcased intentionally on insights and, and within these conversations early on. So this particular team, um, you know, the, to come up with this project. So this is at La Plaza. Um, it's going down Broadway, a main corridor to downtown Los Angeles. And we positioned um, four uh, artists, Mexican American um, artists to really um, create that conversation so that when people are driving by, they, these, these artists are, are there for long-term. So we had to work with the county La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, which is the local museum, um, the city council, uh, the developer, which in this case was Tremel Crow, architect Johnson Fain, um, the Cesar Chavez Foundation, um, as well as the property management um, team, and, and really go through a roster of artists. Um, what kind of conversations do you want to have? What sort of positioning do you want these artists to bring to the table? And so these are really the interesting conversations. And as an art curator in this particular um, moment, I was the entire consultant, but in the role of the art curator, um, I brought forward many different artists, um, their portfolios, and then the selection process was a collaborative process with all of the partners on the table. And so um, I think it was very, uh, telling that we won building team of the year award because it really it, it was a it was a great um, example of how a successful you know team and conversations can really culminate in successful projects okay why now so this is my summary and some of my closing thoughts so as an art consultant and a curator, this is just a glimpse of my creative inspiration um, from trends I've seen for the future of public art, but the future of public art has yet to be seen. Um, it's an energy driver 
energy drivers are the human experience and physical experiences that we see public art um, really be able to showcase. It's different from a museum. It's an uncontrolled environment. And there's a lot of excitement that I have in that uncontrolled environment where you can never predict the experience, the outcome. Um, and that's really what I love because we're always pitching ideas. We don't finish a project and then put it up for sale. We pitch an idea, we pitch an artist, we pitch a vision. And as a team, we really come together and make that project, that vision happen. And there's a, a lot of um, uh, learning that happens within that process. And I think, you know, um, we created Now Art, I created Now Art with this mission and with this vision. And it's what's brought me to where I am today. So that is my presentation. And thank you all for sticking around. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Carmen. This is uh, one of the things that is making our city come alive, uh, certainly. And, and as an advocate to make all of those things happen. I'd like to see a map of where all your projects are. And it'd probably be uh, pretty surprising. I have a map. Chelsea, you can pull up our map. So we <laughs> that would be amazing. Yes, absolutely. Can we yeah. see that? The one of all of the pinpoints. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll pull it up. But yeah, I mean, we've worked, um, you know, obviously we're based in Los Angeles. I think a large part of, um, successful and site-specific art is understanding your community. So we, we often work in this um, location, but we've done projects all around the country. Um, and we actually did a project with a large retailer where we um, went in search of artists in very rural um, locations throughout the country. And it was really telling. Um, it, it was a really phenomenal project because um, we learned a lot about different regions and um, you know, cultural processes and the artists that live there. Um, so, yeah, we're pulling it up. No. Oh, cow. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, that was 746 projects that we did. <laughs> yeah. Um, That, that would be an amazing thing to somehow uh, exhibit all of those or are, are they all on the web? They are. We actually have a, a screen grab that has like the little thumbnails of all of the projects um, and they're quite phenomenal. So and then actually Luminex, um, since we've done that particular project, we have interest in um, San Diego and um, New Orleans, um, Miami. So there's been, I think, you know, because we're all trying to revitalize our communities um, and that was a really great showcase that supported that uh -huh. vision and vision. Um, you know, I, I'm really excited of, of seeing and tracking and, and seeing how that manifests uh, in other areas of the country as well, using local digital artists work. Um, and showcasing, showcasing their work. You know, you you was uh, using the word desire, uh, love, and failure, and you are such a passionate person. <laughs> that I, I was just I was just curious because um, you never mentioned that 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 word before. Uh, you know why why you were talking about your project? Because I think I think the uh, how you were talking about this and this is this is so incredible because your love and passion for all of this creative work um, and and how you were able to see and recognize and and able to kind of um, make this make all of this artist work manifest itself is uh, has a lot to do with your own um, desire with your own passion with your own appetite for this and with your own um, 
uh, uh, I, I don't even know uh, how to express it, but you really wanted to be able to share that. So there's a generosity about how you go about doing this. So you're not just curating it, but you really wanted to share the work with the rest of the world. I have a few um, just sort of talking points on that. And thank you for bringing that up. So I think, you know, I, I studied art and so I do absolutely, it's what gets me up in the morning. Um, but I think that, you know, when I'm working with artists um, and I'm working on projects, I want to throw my hat in the ring, um, but really inspire those artists and push the boundaries. Um, you know, public art, you have to be passionate about because otherwise it's, it's a big, it's a, it's a lot of balls in the air. It's a lot to juggle. Um, and there's a lot of unpredictable moments that happen as a result. Like you guys know, when you're building a building, there's many unforeseeable things that can happen. Um, and so when I'm the bridge to an artist's project, um, there's a level of responsibility that I have, um, but every project that I go into, I want it to be the best project that that artist has ever created in their entire lives. And I want it to be the best project that I've ever created in my entire life. And so, um, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, budgets are restrictive and we found um, a lot of very, uh, you know, ingenious ways to stretch budgets because um, I just don't work uh, like a regular art consultant because I really, um, believe in the work and the power that art has and, and in sort of that mission. And so although we work within budgets, um, I don't think in a budgetary way. And so when I'm working with artists, I first sort of start off with, you know, let's vision together. Like, what is it that let's put the budget aside and all the logistics aside, like, what is it that you would love to make? And let's start from there. And that's really how almost all of my projects um, begin and how, and, and how they end. Um, so, so yeah, I really appreciate you saying that because I think without that passion, um, a, lot, a lot of this would be phoned in and you can tell when things are phoned in, right? But none of us are here for that. So we're here to, uh, to push each other as well as to push ourselves and the responsibility that we have creating art in the public realm is is incredible you know when we did luminex um you know just as like some small takeaways you know fifteen thousand people came but it was the unexpected people it was the you know the family that was that was leaving you know work and they were walking by and they didn't know that they could come into the parking structure because there was a fence there was the houseless person that was leaning against the, the wall that I had a long conversation with and sort of, um, you know, brought him into experience this, this um, exhibit. And when you're creating public art, you're doing it for everyone. It's that access point, right? Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and, and that really starts with um, how we choose our artists, how we choose our projects, and how we position our projects. You know, this is, um, you just remind me of this event at Mo MoCA when they have the book fair. And then I remember going to the book fair and then seeing, you know, family and everybody there and buying books and, and, and little, um, and then they walk into the museum because the museum was also open and free because of the book fair. And this, all of this family and, and kids discovered Jean-Michel Basquiat and just like that. So, so there's this kind of a um, spontaneous way of weaving and discovering and how you would not think book fair and Jean-Michel Basquiat contemporary art would be together. So I think that th those for me are those really beautiful way of, of interweaving and, and allowing for uh, family and for people to discover art and everything else. But you were talking about uh, discovering artists and um, uh, I want to segue into this question from Colleen Peach. Uh, so uh, who was asking about how do you discover artists? Colleen, would you like to ask your question? 
Sure. Hi, Carmen. Um, yeah, I'm just curious about how you scout out new artists. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the process? That's a great question. So, you know, in order to be um, inclusive, uh, we always um, send out an RFQ uh, and we do it through our collaborative team. So whether we're working with the county developers, um, we have a pretty large outreach as well. Um, but we always do an RFQ to make sure that um, local artists feel invited to the table. And then we do our own research. Sometimes I work with, um, with uh, art consultants. We hire art consultants um, that consult uh, for us, depending on the project. Um, or we just do you know, a lot of research and we work in partnerships with uh, museums, um, galleries, and we do a really large deep dive into ensuring that the artists um, uh, you know, are the right artists for the project, but not always working in the medium. And they're not always public artists. Oftentimes, you know, we find some of the most exciting artworks um, are not from public artists because um, sometimes public artists, uh, you know, they, they have their process, um, but it's, you know, they're, they're not pushing mediums or you know sometimes there's restrictions that 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 are there so i love to engage in conversations um and so when we do our rfqs we're not always looking for someone who's working in sculpture um it could be you know someone who has never worked in sculpture in their life but what the conversation that they're bringing to the table with our artwork um we can envision seeing how it could segue um into becoming the right project and the right artists, uh, artists for that project. We have another question here from the, uh, from Mary Davis. Uh, Mary, are you here? You have a question as well. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I think one of the biggest heartbreaks when you're driving around LA and you see public art is when it's been defaced by graffiti. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, I was just wondering how you deal with that. Is there any mm -hmm. special? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it is, it is really unfortunate, um, you know, to see incredible public artwork um, defaced. But, you know, when we're creating projects, we always um, have a maintenance plan. Um, there's always in our contracts a level of expectation um, if the artists are local for them to come back and help repurpose their work um, for stipends and, and fees. So those considerations are made in advance, um, but they're all always baked in. And we work with um, vendors who help to do restoration um, that we recommend to property owners. Um, and we also work with vendors who specialize in um, more professional levels of anti-graffiti coating um, because the maintenance of projects, uh, you know, is really key. But um, again, it goes back to those original conversations that we would have um, as an art consultant and really thinking about how long the longevity of the pieces are. And it's, you know, a lot of different percent for art um, programs and parameters by cultural departments have different um, um, they have different descriptions of longevity. Permanence is sometimes 50 years. Permanence can be 80 years. So it's like when we're thinking about creating public art projects, it's like, what is your um, expectation of permanency? Because that really goes into the type of materials that we can use, the, the processes that we would recommend in terms of maintenance. So all of those considerations really have to be up front and center. Um, and sometimes, you know, property owners, their best recommendation is like, let's just think about this piece being up for 15 years. Um, and in that way, we can use different types of materials, explore in different ways, and then, you know, have it be decommissioned at that time. And that would be built into um, contracts up front with the artists. Thank, thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. We have one, uh, we can take one last question. And I, and I think this one um, probably is, a, is connected to what you were talking about collaboration. And that question is from Eddie Vidales, uh, which has to do with working with city agency. 
Eddie? Yes, hi. Um, so I was just thinking, you mentioned earlier talking about an artist's vision, and I was just thinking about how you bring um, others on board, but particularly cities and governments. I'm wondering like how responsive they are to, to, to how receptive they are to vision, or do they think more in practical terms, or just some of your thoughts on your experience working with um, local governments? Yeah, so there's, you know, there's the, the you know, the hyper-local business improvement districts and then the council, you know, depending on which city you're living in, in America. Um, and then there's the county. Um, you know, if we're working in percent for art projects um, and they're mandated either through the county or through the city, um, you know, and, and there's different cities that have different requirements. Um, Pasadena is totally different from, Culver City, you know, for example, in, in Los Angeles and Sacramento is totally different from San Diego. So there, there are all of those nuances. And so when we're looking at the requirements in terms of working for a city on a public art project, a percent for art project, um, there's a lot of presentations, there is a formula, there are, you know, there's paperwork and bureaucratic requirements that, you know, really have to be followed um, in terms of markers throughout the entire process. So, um, you know, pretty difficult for a lot of artists, you know, to, to wear that hat um, and to navigate those waters. So, you know, we take all of that on. Um, in terms of the responsiveness from county and from city, you know, we've had incredible um, reception, uh, you know, for the, the type of work that we've done. So they've been nothing but, you know, um, advocates and partners in some of the, the larger civic activations that we've created. Um, and then when it comes to actual permanent art pieces, um, you know, again, a lot of them are working within structures and their cultural affairs uh, departments that we, that, you know, we have developed relationships in and are quite familiar with. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does, it does. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Great pre presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to pitch you one last thing because following on to this, of course, there's all this controversy about statuary from the Civil War. Uh, I can think of Richard Serra's piece in New York with the Tilted Ark and um, the, the sort of pushback after maybe, you know, 20 years or 30 years when the aim of that particular piece of art is reinterpreted by as the culture moves along. Um, what would be your take on that as that happens? Yeah, so I mean, I think that um, art is history. And, you know, as we rewrite our history, we have to, you know, go back to some of these monuments and, and have conversations if we want them to continue to represent us in our public landscape. So without um, discrediting um, our history, you know, as we move forward um, or dismantling our history or ignoring our history, I think the conversations really need to be about reframing, um, you know, our cultural landscape now and, um, and creating a place in the history books, um, both of why those pieces were up and why they're no longer relevant. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that those are really, um, you know, those are really charged uh, conversations because there's passion behind them. And that's really, you know, art needs to be um, uh, stimulating those types of conversations and, and it needs to be responsive to those conversations. And so my sort of, you know, take on it and suggestion on it would be, you know, what artwork would be appropriate in its place? Mm, that's great. Interesting. Yep, gave you a hardball. <laughs> yeah, I love hardballs. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carmen. That has been really a fascinating conversation. And um, I think um, with, with that, I, I'd like to turn it back to um, David and Corinne. Okay, so I'm going to uh, kind of wrap everything up. Um, thank everyone for attending tonight and thank you to our moderators 
Ming Fung and Craig Hodgetts and our presenters, Yasa Sokolovic and um, Noel O'Connell. And um, of course, Carmen Zella, thank you. Um, and then also a thank you to our participating sponsors, Armstrong Ceilings, Integrated Marketing Solutions and Moza, and our virtual exhibitors, PLP um, SoCal and SolarTube International. And um, so please uh, also join us next Tuesday at the same time for our second evening of the Creativity Conference.